Welcome back, everybody, to Uncensored CMO. And in this episode, I've got a really great CMO joining me. Here's Lex Bradshaw Zanger, who is CMO at L'Oreal. L'Oreal is the biggest beauty brand in the world. They have got 36 brands. They cover every country, every continent. And in this episode, we're getting into some really good topics. We're going to talk about how generalists rule the world. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, in the age where there are so many specialisms, so much data, there's so much going on in the world, actually being a generalist can be an advantage. We're also going to talk about introverts versus extroverts. So how does an introvert cope with being a very senior marketer in, in, under a lot of pressure, managing loads of brands as well? And we're also going to talk about Elon Musk as well and what we can learn from Elon Musk about brand building and how brand building today is probably the biggest skill that the marketer needs to be successful. Now, ladies and gentlemen, if you are still listening to this in audio, can I direct you over to the YouTube channel where not only can you listen, but you can also watch and also hit the subscribe button and never miss an episode again. There's so much in this episode. I know you're going to love it. Here's my interview with Lex. Welcome to the show, Lex. Thank you. Glad to be with you. Now, we were chatting about your favourite quote, weren't we, just uh, just earlier, <laughs> which I think we both relate to, the kind of jack-of-all-trades yeah. quote, but it has a finish that uh, maybe not everyone's aware of. Yep, no, no, it's, it's something. When I discovered it, I felt really happy. You know? So it's jack-of-all-trades, master of none. That's the bit that everybody knows. But then there's a bit afterwards, which is, and oftentimes better than master of one, which is this whole notion of sort of generalists and specialists and, and experience coming together. Well, let's come on to that. But um, but before we do, I'd love to understand a bit about your career journey so far, because unusually, actually, you've, you've had quite a varied career, both client side and agency side as well. Uh, I'd love to kind of unpack that a bit. But, but for people listening and watching, tell us how you got to where you are today. My goodness. So I think, you know, I tend to say that I've had two careers with a pivot in the middle. So as you said, I spent the first probably almost 10 years agency side combination of, I guess, what we used to call networked Madison Avenue agencies, but always in a sort of digital transformation-ish role, and then in digital pure play agencies. And I did that in Paris, a bit in London, New York, and then Dubai. Then I went to work for a company called Facebook in those days. I know they're called Meta now, but I can't get my head around it. And so I was at Facebook in Paris for a couple of years. Super exciting time. Uh, there was the Instagram acquisition, the IPO. They went onto a mobile app, which was super stressful for the company at the time. And then, as you say, that was the pivot, and I went client-side. So before L'Oreal, I was at McDonald's. I was the head of digital for McDonald's for Europe. And, and I joined L'Oreal in 2016, and I'm now on my third or fourth role after six years in the group, uh, just, to, just in the process of migrating from London to Singapore. So an exciting journey and definitely client and agency side. Uh, I've seen both of them. Well, I love the way you said London, Paris, New York, Dubai. It almost sounds like kind of a big fashion brand, doesn't it? You know, <laughs> what you seem to have London, Paris, New York, Milan sort of thing on them. But um, what, what did you learn when you were working agency side that, that actually, or, or maybe to put it a different way, what did you learn on agency side, I guess, both media and creative that clients could learn from? I think, you know, what, what's exciting about the agency world is the creativity, the innovation, but it's narrow, isn't it? It's narrow, it's focused on, I don't know what we call it, communications, Marcom, IMC. So you learn super hardcore communication strategy. You know, you've really, you know, I started off as a strategic planner. You know, you've really got to understand what you're trying to get to. And you learn the balance of, of creativity and science. You know, there's a bit of research, but there's the creativity. There is the creative process with copywriters, art directors, all these things. My first ever job was, was actually in a kind of brand consultancy, and that was really exciting. And so, you know, that's always stuck with me, you know, the importance of brand. And we'll, I'm sure we'll talk more about brand codes and distinctive assets. So I think you learn that. But when you go client side, you realize that that's just one piece of the pie and, and the marketing pie is so much bigger. I think that's the thing that struck me. I remember, um, I think one of my agencies asked me, what percentage of my time do I spend on communication? And I actually thought, oh, that's quite an interesting question. I went through my diary. And I actually worked out that only 5% of my time as a CMO was actually on the advertising bit of the mix, which is quite shocking. I mean, I remember talking to Ritson and I think he did a similar poll and it was 8%. And I think that's something agencies often don't realise, do they? That um, they're just servicing one very, not, well, very important, but but in terms of time, quite a small part of the mix. No, it's it, completely true. You know, I think that's, uh, well, one, when you work in a corporation, a large organisation that's not an agency, there's a lot of admin that goes on, you know, the time you spend on finance or NHR or legal, looking after your people. I think Antonio Lucio, who was CMO of HP or Facebook, you know, he said that being a CMO is 90% chief and 10% marketing. And it's true. You know, I think my job overall is to make sure we've got the right people in the right places doing the right thing. It's not so much the exciting creative work and 
getting the right visual or exactly the right copy, although that's super exciting. Yeah. It's funny, I, I, I can't remember where I picked this up, but I borrowed this, right? But, but the, someone said there are, there are four Ps for most marketers and then there's, a, there's six Ps for the CMO. Well, there are two P, extra Ps for CMO and one is politics and persuasion. And it, it's so true, isn't it? Because what, the thing that I remember shocked me when I first became a CMO was I'm not doing the work any longer and I missed it. I mean, I, I, I almost had, I think, the most extreme uh, induction to becoming a CMO because I, I was a marketing director in a SME, very hands-on. In fact, the first day uh, in the job, I had to design the company logo. Literally, I did the company uniforms, the factory stuff. You know, I, I, I created the Twitter handle, you know, and I went from there and I, I would, uh, joined um, uh, Lucasaber, I've been a Centauri. So I then went to a fairly big organization, big brands, big teams. And it was a real shock because suddenly I'm like, I'm not doing the doing anymore sort of thing. And weirdly, I remember this one, um, this one moment where I think quite a junior member in the team came up to me and said to me, oh my God, you actually know what it is I do. And I said, I said I'm sorry to say this, I was doing it about a week ago. <laughs> you know, it's only like now that it's changed, but it's a real like, wake, you know, wake up call. That, so I guess on that, what makes a CMO successful in terms of the things that go beyond, the, I guess, the standard four Ps? I think you said it in a way, you know, because... Yes, you're not doing the work, but you've got to know what's going on and understand what's going on. You know, in our business, we've got we've got 37 international brands, different in different countries, but more or less that, you know, I can't get engaged in the work for 37 brands and see each campaign and see what's going on. But you've got to understand what's going on, understand the process, understand the skills that need to be to get there. So I think I look at, at my job and at, and at my direct team as kind of marketing excellence. You know, we look at the right skill sets, the right way to measure, the right way to approach these things learning what one brand's doing well and passing it on to another. And, and, and so I think that's, you know, at the end of the day, the CMO is probably more of the conductor of the orchestra and the artists and the actual work that goes on is happening all across the brands, all across the touch points. Marketing is so complicated today anyway. You know, if we yeah. think versus 10 years ago, the complexity of channels and content and media platforms and what we have to do, you can't be managing everything directly. You've got to make sure that the people are set up to do it right. How do you get the balance between, because I, I know this is something I, I struggle quite a lot with, how do you get the balance between doing what you would have done versus, versus kind of empowering the team to be successful? How, how do you strike that balance? So, I mean, I have to say that occasionally I, I, I do go and get involved with stuff because it's fun and it's nice to go and do it. And, you know, when you've got 30-something brands to play with, there's always an occasion to go and get involved and probably go deep into something. But I think, you know, a lot of our job is about communication and sharing and leadership. And that's how you make things work. You, know, you take something that somebody's done, understand why it's happened and sharing. It's not, I think it's more than just sharing crudely. You've got to look at things, understand what's going on, and then, and then drive it forward. You know, in the, in the Western world, and I, I can say that now as I'm sort of moving to Asia, you know, we spend a lot of time looking at China. But we can't just copy and paste what China's doing. We have to go understand how it works and say, okay, what's the, what's the human insight behind this? How do we replicate it? Or what's replicable? How do we do it differently? What do we need to do? And so that's, that's probably the most important thing is understanding why things are going on. And I love that. There's, I think that's what I love about our business is the consumer piece. You know, it's a little bit about, you talked about persuasion internally, but persuading the consumer, understanding how they're going to react, the emotion behind it. Now that's, that's what brands are all about, aren't they? It is. It's funny, actually. I often talk to creative teams or agencies that have got amazing ideas and they can't get them away. And, and, and I said, well, actually, one of the jobs of a CMO is to convince the business to do the right thing. And actually, it's a real skill set and, and, and not to be underestimated, but you need to be able to. It's interesting, the, the art and science, because often what I've found is often you can't just persuade. You need the evidence and data to back it up. So it's both art and science, isn't it? And sometimes you need the science bit to convince people to, to get behind the sort of big creative idea, as it were. Well, and the science in marketing is probably what's exploding at the moment. The amount of people talking about measurement and econometrics and modeling you know data in marketing is probably the single biggest subject that's happening at the moment and everybody needs that but but i think what's so important is that we get data behind it but then we don't just follow it blindly it's an input it's guidance and it's this balance of art and science and then so we've got to understand what the art is the art is it's not instinct i think it's experience it's a, it's different experiences coming together understanding what works well understanding consumers but that's a really good point. Often we like we have the debate about AI as well, don't we? I, I think with data, it's telling you whether something worked, how to make it better. Yeah. 
yeah. that's that's the creativity, isn't it? I think we forget that, isn't it? You, you, you can go based on, well, that didn't, didn't work or whatever, but how do you make it better? And that's where you know, creativity is so important. And we have to remember that AI is just a, a supreme combination of everything that's happened in the past. It's not it's not yet a crystal ball for mm. the future. It's only working on trends. Yeah, it can't tell you what to do, It can, it, but it could take a brie. Well, actually, that's interesting. I remember talked to quite a few people, actually, and they've all come back and said the same thing. The key to making AI work is actually the brief. Yeah. Like, how you brief and what the brief is is the critical part. And it can do a lot for you, but it's nowhere unless it's briefed well. So that's the skills for all of our marketers for the future is understanding how to how to wrangle AI and how to use it versus yeah. anything else. Actually, uh, one of my uh, friends on LinkedIn, John James, did a, did a brilliant quote on Twitter the other day. And uh, he, he just said, uh, given that marketers are useless at briefing, I think the future of AI is, I think our jobs are safe, you know. Oh, that reminds, have you seen the work on the better briefs work? You know, it's, yeah. Uh, yeah. it's a scary thought that we're getting worse at briefing and it's and it's really, really hard. Well, weirdly, the more, the more tools you have around you, I think the less you focus on the brief. Because, I mean, back, back in the day, I guess, when we were sort of learning our craft, the brief was so important, isn't it? Like, you know, you're putting a lot of money into one thing, you better work, right? And now with so much data and so much proliferation of tools, it's easy to think that doing lots of stuff is effectively going to make you successful when you've got to think about how you cut through and make it make it work it's the, it's the balance of strategy and tactics and marketing has got there's so much going on that it's all becoming tactical and there's so much energy that goes in there that you're right there's not enough thinking around what's the core objective what's the core strategy and yes i, do, I think writing a brief you know it's the sort of thing people leave to five minutes before it's due and then try and scrabble something down on paper and it's a mess yeah, definitely. Well, we'll definitely come back to some of that because I think, think there's, there's lots in there. I'd love just to talk a little bit more about, about your career. You've done quite a few different things. You, you know, we, we talked about squiggly careers, didn't we, in terms yeah. of, you know, I think both of us actually kind of share that. What's the benefit, do you think, of having a, a, such a varied career like you've had? I think, I think it's definitely experience and experiences. You know, and you can put that down to different places, different types of organisations, different company cultures, different categories. Um, there's a book I love. It's called Range by Epstein. I think we talked about it before. You know, that was one of the one of these books that almost saved me because yes, I was criticised for having a kind of a bouncing about career, too squiggly, not committal. But when I look back at it and think, God, I was super lucky. I was on the on the crest of the wave for everything that was new when mobile apps were big, when CRM was happening. You know, I remember working at Ogilvy on IBM when we were doing digital advertising, and not everybody was doing it. You know, we were doing banners and resizing banners all the time. So, so I've been lucky to touch. I don't know how many categories, automotive, CPG, food and beverage, banks. And that experience you don't get if you stay in the same place for a long period of time. You get other benefits, of course. Um, so I think there's a massive value now. You know, I, There's an expression, but I'm going to get it wrong. It's like when you only got a hammer, everything looks like a nail. When you've got a lot of experiences, a lot of tools in your toolbox, then suddenly you're better at solving problems. I'm quite encouraged by that book and that idea because... I, I, as I look at my career as well, if you've gone down a specialist route, you might find AI replaces you, right? Whereas actually, I don't think anytime soon AI is going to replace the generalist that can, that can see the whole thing, put the strategy together, connect the dots. I mean, at the moment, at least, I hope <laughs> AI is not doing that. And that's, that's the important thing, I think, for marketers to understand, well, back to your toolkit, right? Understand what the tools are and how to apply them broadly, not just specifically, I think is absolutely critical. I think everybody in marketing wants to talk about strategy, but nobody's really, really clear on what it is because it's sort of the magic in between everything. It's the magic of crossing skills in one space into another or the magic of connecting different dots. And maybe AI will get to that at some point, but it's definitely not there yet. And also the other thing I noticed is, is problem solving as well. Because like, if you've been in a few different industries, you, you've, you've done some different diff, you know, done some different disciplines, you can also solve a problem in a way that when you work with people that have just done the one thing, you yeah. go, well, actually, when I was over here, we solved it like this. Or have you thought about doing it like that? It can be, can be quite powerful. No, but that's, that's definitely it. You know, I think and, and understanding how different categories approach communications, how different categories build brands and experiences. And everything's crossing over now. You, you see that in our business where we used to have very different brands that operated in different spaces. They're all coming together online. And, and it's the same thing. You know, we have to think about how car brands are built versus financial brands. You know, the, the fundamentals of marketing are coming back to life and becoming way more important. And so you need cross-category, cross-product experience. It's interesting that. It's, it's almost like fundamental marketing 20 years ago were obviously well-established. And then I think it maybe was assumed that digital was going to transform everything and, and, and they no longer applied. And it's almost like we're now relearning them you know, in, in a weird sense, isn't it? There's a bit of a uh, renaissance. Completely. And I think yeah. there are two things that have happened. You're right, you know, digital came. And so one, people spent all of their energy on digital. So they kind of dropped everything else. Then there was this notion of sort of data utopia where everything was going to be run by the machine and we'd have a single customer view across every platform. And so all we'd need to do is sit back and, and drive the machine. 
And then suddenly this notion of, okay, I've got loads of different things going on. The data's not connected. I've forgotten all my fundamentals about consumer and brand. And so we're in this sort of crazy mess we are in now. And that's what's exciting suddenly, because now there's so many more, I don't know, so many more instruments to play with, so many more colors on the palette. But you've got to understand what you're doing at a strategic level. Yeah, I think I, I always think a little bit about the time I was at Facebook was quite interesting because they were moving from being sort of a social network where people were chatting to a true media platform. And so we were starting to go to clients and say, OK, well, if you need reach, if you want to do top of the funnel, you want to do awareness, we've got reach. But if you want to do performance and direct response or app installs, that was a big thing at one point, you know, we've got other products for that. And I think clients didn't understand that a single platform could do multiple objectives because historically the platform and the objective match. You know, if you wanted broad awareness, well, you went to TV. If you wanted someone to take 20% off, well, you put a coupon in the Sunday Times or something like that. And I think that's the real complexity is that you've really got to be clear on your strategy now because the strategy defines how you use the platform, what sort of content, what sort of creative. It's a lot more merged as well, isn't it? Because I think that, that you, you know, you can ba- you can build brands on digital, right, in a way that maybe people don't realise. Equally, you can activate things on TV, you know, that you couldn't do before. So, the, like you say, the role and the channel's merging a lot more, isn't it? Um, so we talked about generous. What would be the skills that you think marketers today particularly need to have as you, as you look at all this change and complexity, you know, around the world? I think there are, there are lots of... I don't think there's one specific set of skills for marketers. I think we talked about, you know, we used to talk about I-shaped, T-shaped and M-shaped. You know, the, the I-shaped was, you know, I'm an expert, I only do one thing. Then probably maybe six, seven years ago, we got to these T-shaped marketers. You know, you've got to be an expert in something because everything's new but you've got to have a little bit of understanding of everything. And now we've got to this point where, where everything's cross-functional into interlocked. So you've got to have a few different skills. And I think that's the M, you know, you've got sort of three verticals and the horizontal. I think there are probably some fundamental skills. You know, we talk a lot about data on the one hand and creativity on the other, sort of the little bit the art and science we we're talking about. But data doesn't mean writing Python scripts. It just means understanding that how do you make decisions based on data or how do you understand that data's wrong or it's only an input? And then on the other end, creativity, it's not about art directors. It's not just about agency work. It's about thinking differently. It's about pulling skills or techniques from other categories and bring it together. But then in between, there are so many other skills. Are you a content expert? Are you an influence expert? Are you a media mix or performance media? Or are you TikTok versus uh, the Facebook, the meta suite of apps now? But what I think what's for me in my mind, when you think about the M, is you put all of these different marketers together and they've got some of the verticals that inter- interlock and some that don't. And it sort of creates a honeycomb effect of, okay, I've got lots of people that are covering all the specialisms and yet together they're creating this extremely strong kind of coherent approach to the brand problems. I love the last bit you said there, actually, because just listening to you talk about the different bits of the M, I mean, you, you could spend a lifetime trying to master all the legs of the M, couldn't you, potentially? But isn't that, going back to our generous thing, the magic here is actually how do you pull all that together based on a good strategy that's, that's rooted in consumer understanding? And that's, where, that's, in a way, what takes us back, doesn't it, to what, probably where we started our careers is what's the consumer insight? What are you trying to do? What, you know, what levers have you got to, you know, strategy levers to deliver sort of thing? And that's probably the, the thing that is a skill set, I think, overall that's, that's missing. This, and that's probably, I think, the biggest challenge. You know, we were talking about what the CMO does. The biggest challenge is how do you balance a team structure of, generalists, specialists, somewhere in between, and who's the architect pulling it all together? Because that's the hardest piece. You've got to make sure that the things you're doing, you're doing them really, really well, but that everything's working together to give a, a combined experience. You know, we don't have just offline consumers or just offline online consumers, but we definitely have people who are experts in those spaces who don't do both things. The thing, the thing I know that used to used to frustrate me when I was in the in the kind of CMO chair is is how you can kind of create such an industry of doing. You know what I mean? It's like you know, uh, you, 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 I guess in the old days you'd you'd have your campaign, you might have a, a trade version or a trade marketing version of it or whatever. You'd have the above the line bit. You know, you, you might have an experiential bit. You know, th- th- there was. A few very easy, not easy, but a few very tangible things. Now it's so, the, the, the amount of versions and the, you can't really control it all, can you? There's so much. And I think for me, just the question is, do we know what works? It's just like a fundamental question, isn't it? You have to ask yourself because otherwise just become this production industry creating so many different variables. So how do you know what kind of what works and doesn't work when you've got so much under your control? Now you, you come back to this point about data and, and measurement, so important. So you're right, you know, one campaign for one of our brands could have hundreds and hundreds of assets between what we see as kind of, I guess, traditional communication, I'm not sure what traditional is anymore, all the way through to all the things that need to sit on a website. 
you know, and, and even on Amazon, you know, Amazon used to be just about product shots, but now in the Amazon gallery, you've got to have content that communicates as well. So, so one, you've got to create all these different pieces. The measurement piece about understanding what works is hard. You know, I think there's a, there's a whole industry that's growing up to say, okay, how do you start to tag and build the data and bring it all back together? But I think we're a long way from another sort of utopia where you put all that together. But, uh, but measurement is, is an enormously exploding space. How do I measure in the context of one channel? How do I measure in the context of a whole campaign and the context of a whole brand? And I think that's, you know, that's where we've had this resurgence of econometrics in MMM because you know, we were in a world where everything was about attribution and then suddenly privacy and walled gardens came along and everybody was suddenly kind of shocked and didn't understand what's happening. You know, talk to marketers who saw their, their ROI or their ROAS go from seven to three and they say, well, we need to stop. And it's, it's not because it's got worse. It's just because it's invisible. So just understanding that is a big step. And that's so, so econometrics is suddenly flourishing because it's the technique that enables us to look at lots of different things and start to have guidance and visibility. So amazing uh, data actually over at Meta that I came across very recently. I, th- I think they, they involve Les Burnett in this, but they worked, I think the statistic was 60% of the benefit of the brand campaign, any campaign on Meta, came outside of the window in which they measured it which I just thought was like such a breakthrough idea, wasn't it? Because we've become so attribution led and last click and looking at what happened in that campaign window that the bigger benefit happened afterwards. And if, if you're not measuring for that, you're just literally missing, you know, a huge part of the mix. Well, I, I sometimes ask some of our younger marketers, you know, I try and ask them what a GRP is. And you sometimes get blank looks because people don't remember what GRP even stands for. And then you talk about reach and frequency and they don't understand that reach and frequency are together. So you don't hear people talking about that. You don't hear people talking about decay rate anymore. You know, it's not something that exists because you're right. We're very short-term attribution. But then as the data shows, it's, it's much bigger than that. So we've got to go back to fundamentals. We've got to stop looking at, at digital and other channels separately. Much more holistic, much more kind of measurement-based and understand what things are doing. And that's the role of the brand, you know. I think we talked about it. My first ever job was in brand consulting in the U.S., and I've stuck with that. We don't even talk about media neutral anymore, but I think I was media neutral and brand centric. I love brands and the emotional connection behind it. Brand building is probably one of those things that we we are rediscovering the importance of, particularly after going through COVID and a sort of global, you know, uncertainty as well. That's when you see whether your brand's, you know, good, strong or not. One of my favorite um, Ehrenberg Bass data points is, I love this, is that if you come across the 95-5 rule, it's the idea that in any, they, they, they've looked at B, it's B2B, but I think probably holds for B2C as well. They looked at basically who, how many people are in the market for your products at any one time. And they worked out on average, only 5% of your potential audience are actually in the market when you're, when you're, you know, when you're communicating to them. So, of course, what we're doing is we're forgetting we need to be building plans for the 95%, not just the 5%. And that, I just thought, was just such a stunning data point to kind of make, you know, show the importance why brand building is, is so key. No, no. I mean, yeah, so I have heard that point and it's And it's super interesting because it just it forces people to change slightly this notion of being at the bottom of the funnel and trying to find someone. It, it depends on what, what category you're in, though, because we're in FMCG, so frequency is high. But when you talk about cars, for example, you know, the car industry, the auto industry knows that much better. They know that the in-market audience is quite small. And so they're building leads and, and the pipeline's longer. But well, there was, a, there was a, case, a case that I loved. This is 20 years ago now, but, but Volkswagen shifted. They, they had this belief originally that basically all the investment should go in store, right? In, um, do you call it stores? Where you buy dealerships. That's it, yeah. That's a classic, isn't it? An industry, you're calling itself by its, you know, its internal communication rather than what the customer would. Anyway, um, the dealership, right? So all the marketing was in dealership. Right? We want the best, best dealers. We want the most you know, amazing brochures. We want the best experience as you go. And it makes sense. Until they did the research, which they worked out, apparently that 90%, I think it's 90% of people have already decided yeah. what car they want to buy before they go in. And what they worked out is actually most people's consideration sets of which car they want to buy happen in the three or four years between buying cars. So you're almost constantly doing this kind of mental, you know, kind of, oh, which car should I get next sort of thing. Um, and they basically, they flipped almost their entire spend above the line to sort of build, you know, build, build kind of brand awareness when people weren't in the market, because actually that's when the decision got made. I, I, worked on, I worked on the GM business in the Middle East for a long time, and, and notably Cadillac, which is an exciting brand to work on over there. And, and so completely that research was super relevant. And they said well, people spend more time looking at cars in the street than they do in the dealership. Yeah. And so there was all this kind of activation is how do you make every car on the street 
the equivalent of the dealership and you start to use your phone and you use augmented reality to see what's happening and that sort of thing. But it's true. Now, now talking of cars, um, we've just learned, haven't we, that Elon Musk, after many, many, many years, has decided to do advertising for the first time, which I thought was interesting. Now, mar- the marketing Twitterverse seems to be divided on this one because it's like I seem to see on the one hand, everyone's going, well, there we go. It's just proven all along that, you know, advertising, advertising works. And the other half of marketing Twitter are basically saying, well, it proves you can build a brand to become 300 billion without advertising. What, do you have a point of view on uh, which way it goes? So there's a cynical point of view that he's just trying to drive Twitter's advertising revenue and so he needs to talk it up. No, I think I think he's he's built an incredible brand because he had a massive first mover advantage. Tesla was way ahead and he has his own technique, his own style of kind of communicating and building the brand. But probably him as the only megaphone for the brand isn't scalable beyond a certain point. And then I think if you look at what's happening in the EV industry probably getting to the point where the competitors are getting as good as Tesla. And so he needs to show real USP, real differentiation, and he can't do that on his own. So I think there's there's lots of things happening. You know, there's, there's market dynamics that mean that they've got to change their approach. There's the dynamism of his category, the business. But uh, it's true. He's built a lot of brands. He's a brand himself. He's the spokesperson for that brand. And he gets a lot of coverage probably not scalable eventually. I think you're right. And, and I know when I thought about it, I think both answers are correct, actually, because I, I think, can you build a brand without advertising? Clearly, he's proven it. But I think what people forget is advertising is not the only lever to build men's availability. Because if you think about what he's, you know, he has become famous through putting you know, rockets on Mars or whatever and, you know, building gigafactories. And even like he'll announce some software upgrade on a Tesla and that'll get talked about. You know, so he's he himself has become a media channel, hasn't he? And, and built fame, a bit like, you know, P.T. Barnes and when he kind of created the circus and, you know, invented the greatest showman. So I think, you know, Elon himself, and I think we forget actually that, you know, personalities can, can become media challenges on that very well. But at the same time, would advertising help him now that he's got less of a product advantage? Well, yes, it would. There was something interesting in what he said. I think he talked about the fact that if he was going to do advertising, I think he mentioned two things. He said, one, it would be more content led. That's an interesting kind of way to go. And he also talked about the fact that it would, it would look at features of the car that were less known. And I think there's, there's a big parallel to our business. I'm not saying that beauty and cars are the same, but, you know, we use a lot of influence and advocacy and UGC. So other people talking about the products. And there's definitely a lot of people talking about Tesla, which is why people are talking about it. But at a certain point, when you want to build your brand based on specific attributes or specific functionality, and people aren't talking about that, then you've got to bring the brand voice alongside the other voices to balance that out. And so that's probably what he's trying to do. You know, if, if Tesla's got a new competitive advantage because of, whatever, what the in-board, onboard computer's doing or the autopilot, and not everybody's talking about that, then he's got to get that word out somewhere. And I think that's that's a big piece of marketing today is, is it's not just the brand talking, but everybody else talking. How do you manage that? How does it drive the brand? How does it drive specific messaging? How does it drive commerce? There's, there's lots to manage there. Well, this must be a good conversation to have, actually, because obviously L'Oreal being... The, is it the world's biggest We beauty? are the number one beauty company That's in the amazing. World. And it's funny because obviously you're, you're famous for L'Oreal brand, but there are so many more brands within I don't know, I have to be careful. So we, we have the number one beauty brand in the world, L'Oreal Paris. L'Oreal, yeah. We have the number one makeup brand in the world, Maybelline New York, but we have, whatever, 35 other brands. Uh, and, and I imagine influencers form a, a core part of what you do as well. So uh, what's the key, particularly in your category, to, for why influencers are so important and how do you use them? And so I think, well, so the first thing is, I saw this study a long time ago that looked at different categories and looked at sort of paid, owned, earned, and looked at which categories had more earned in them. And, and the number one category was travel. Everybody looks at TripAdvisor before going to a hotel or to a destination. And the second category is beauty. So beauty is massively up there in terms of, I listen to people I trust, people who are credible before making a choice. For us, it's, 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 it's an enormous space, you know, from brand ambassadors who are walking on the catwalk at Cannes Film Festival, all the way down to sort of your friends talking about products and everything in between. You know, we have dermatologists, we have salon professionals. So it's, it's really understanding who are the advocates. So you've got, I mean, there's lots of different terminology. You've got brand ambassadors, celebrities, they call them KOLs in Asia, you know, key opinion leaders. You've got medical professionals, hair care professionals. You've got your aunt, your uncle, somebody who lives down the road. And so all of these different people at different levels are communicating. You know, we talk about how people are on TikTok all the time, creating content and sharing it. How do you harness that? How do you make it available? So, so we work lots of different ways. We work short-term, long-term, seeding products, you know, every different way you can imagine with, with different influencers and KOLs and affiliates. And that's all the way down into, into commerce now. You know, TikTok shop 
started here in the UK, but it's an enormous business in Asia, in China, it's an enormous business in Indonesia, which I'm, which I'm going off to run now. And it's enormous business in terms of actually affiliates selling. So it seems it's, it's a different model. It comes back to this point about content. It's all the way through the funnel. You know, you're exposed to something, there's content that's interesting, and then you're clicking through and buying it. Uh, I think, I think we called it retailtainment a few years ago. I don't know whether that phrase is going to stick. But. So just to understand that, that's interesting. I, I'm not for a minute imagining I'd ever become a, <laughs> an influencer for a L'Oreal product, but let's say I was. Maybe, maybe um, I don't know, anti-aging cream. There you go. There you go. I'll, I'll be your anti-aging cream. I'm sure you've got something you in know. your hair from us today. Well, indeed. Yeah, probably have, actually. So were, were, I, were I an influencer for you, does that mean that if I produce some content and it goes out there, the, the audience could literally just click and buy just on one click? Is that what you're saying? So th- there are lots of different ways to work. And I think there are really, you know, two groups now. You know, there are influencers who want to still use their audience and want to be a publisher. They want to be a media. So that's the big people. You know, that's big celebrities who've got big reach. And so there you're kind of, you're more like a media product. You say, okay, I'm going to sell my reach uh, and I'm going to sell that. And there's another group that says, okay, maybe I haven't got a lot of reach, but I can make really good content that's going to make people click through and buy. And then that becomes an affiliate model and you're taking a percentage of the sales. So TikTok shop is a great example of that. People are creating massive amounts of content on TikTok. And depending on how you're structured, you can tag a brand, tag a product. And people can drop it in their basket and click through and then a small percentage goes through to the affiliate. And that's an incredible model because you think about you know, the equivalent, we, we have beauty advisors in some stores, in department stores who kind of sell product and, and to a certain lesser extent in supermarkets. Suddenly you've got an enormous sales force of people talking about your product. I think that's about, I mean, we were talking about earlier about my uh, trip to New York and in being in Sephora and getting completely lost. I mean, I was, I, I was, I was over in New York and my, my daughters gave me a list of things they wanted from Sephora. And uh, I went in and I was just totally bewildered by, like, honestly, that it was so big and I didn't know where to start. And I remember, I, I think I tried to hunt out the youngest, like, assistant in the thinking she'd be close enough to my, my daughter's age and just said, if you had $100 uh, and you were 15, <laughs> what would you buy kind of thing? But it's so true, isn't it? I mean, particularly today when there is so much choice out there, where do you start? That actually influence have such a key role, don't they, in, in making that? I know, I mean... And my younger daughter actually is such a big fan of TikTok. And like almost every day she goes, oh, can we do this? And I'm like, why are we doing this? She goes, oh, so-and-so on TikTok kind of did it. You know? And that's this explosion of social commerce. And it yeah. really is that, you know, it's maybe retailtainment is the old name and, and, and social commerce is the new name. But it's how do you go from content to commerce in a frictionless experience? And very, very quickly, you know, you're almost, you're almost taking what we thought of as the marketing funnel and doing it in one step. Definitely. That's no, fascinating. So look, we talked about, you know, econometrics, the importance of measuring things, we're talking about influence. As, as you look at the world, obviously you've got a very big role, you know, you cover the, cover the whole world. Or not cover the whole world, sorry, but <laughs> one day, one day you will. What, what other trends are you seeing out there that you think could be useful for marketers? So I think we've talked about two that are really important, you know, the role that data plays everywhere, yeah. whether that's data in understanding what's happening in the market, data against media and campaign planning, data against consumers. You know, we talk about first party and second party audiences and how people build audiences today. So I think, you know, data is transforming marketing everywhere. Doesn't mean that it's going to transform it to a point where its computer says yes or no, but I think everybody needs to understand. The other one we've talked a lot about is is advocacy and influence. So many platforms now where consumers, professionals have to share a point of view and share content. I think creativity is still going to be really important. And we've talked about that a little bit. But we probably need to come back to creativity and come back to brands and branding. You know, I love to talk about distinctive assets or brand codes. In a world where probably, I don't know, 80% of what a consumer sees is created by other consumers, how do you come in as the brand and make sure you're actually delivering on the message you want? And how do you do that in a way that cuts through, that creates the right emotional connection, leaves a lasting impact? We're going back to some of probably some, some core branding exercises. And that's hard work to do it well. Mm, that's really good. I, I love your point there because actually the, the the more proliferation in terms of media channels, the more proliferation in terms of number of influence. I mean, you've probably got thousands of influence, haven't yeah. you? Influencers, right? You, you're almost giving away kind of creative control a little bit, aren't you, to, to other people to, you know, do your production. That's where fluent devices and, you know, distinctive assets become critical, don't they? Because otherwise you're not going to have the thing that connects them up and makes them memorable and comes to mind quickly. And that's the hardest piece because working with influencers, you know, I think early on people really tried to control what the influencer was doing. They treated them like an agency, you know, seven back and forth. You need to tweak that. The color's not right. And suddenly an influencer says, well, hang on. If you want me for my authenticity and credibility, then you can't tell me what to do. So, so what we know is that, you know, you need to leave the freedom 
for their authenticity to come through, for them to be credible. But then how do you deliver the brand through that? I think there is a piece about distinctive assets. I think there's a piece maybe where we start to work with influencers and say, okay, well, if you could just use this asset or this color in a certain way, then it'll weave it together. But your point's exactly spot on. How do you weave together the multitude of different connections and touch points to make a coherent story? And as we know with Bud Light recently, right, it, it can also blow up, can't it? So you also got to manage reputation and, and your perception of your brand in a, in a very good way as well. Another thing I want to ask you about is a huge portfolio, lots of incredible brands, you know. How do you innovate, particularly with the smaller brands? Because obviously you've got some very, very big well-known brands, but how do you also innovate, become innovative and also get behind smaller brands? We're one portfolio. You know, our brands are split into four divisions. The divisions historically have come through their sales channel. So our luxury di- luxury division was sold in department stores, our dermatological beauty through pharmacies, mass through supermarkets, professional through sales. But that's all crossing over now, particularly online. You know, you'll find e-commerce sites where you'll find products from all of our divisions. So as, as everything comes together, all the brands are learning from each other. And so I think historically, it's a little bit like our conversation about media channels. Historically, things were very separate and they had their own way of operating. Now everything's coming together. And so we can do a lot of cross-pollination. And that's why we're structured in this way. So we have we have teams that work on specific brands, but then we have teams that work across the whole business. And their objective is to say, okay, how do I harness, I don't know, this platform or this content type, make it work. So we have you know, 37 brands across, I think, five categories, you know, hair care, hair color, skincare, fragrance, makeup. And so, so there, there is so much cross-pollination and understanding of what's going on. And then there are, of course, differences in terms of how the brands come to market. So it's, it's really this model, you know, so we're not like some of our competitors where their brands are very, very separate. You know, some designer brands, you really don't look at each other and don't cross-pollinate. We do that a lot. And, and our skill sets mean that we can take everybody forward, big brand or small brand. So if you spot a new trend, how would you decide which of those brands is going to be the one to lead that, that trend? Or I mean, do they, they get, do they get to decide themselves? Or do you kind of look at it as a portfolio and go, well, we're best positioned to, for that brand to lead us into that? So I think I think it depends on the it depends on the trends, you know. So so we don't do product we don't create product in the UK where or product created centrally out of what we call our marketing centers, some in Paris, some in New York, LA, Shanghai. So there's a piece about product trends where it depends on what sort of research and innovation we've got. So as beauty companies go, we are much, much larger in R and D or we call it R and I than anyone else in the world. So we do all of our own product development. So that's a big piece that means that so trends in product, we can be faster to market and we can deploy them. Trends in communication and what people are talking about, I think there is a logic there that sits with the brands. You know, the brands know what sort of audience they're talking to and what's relevant for them. You know, a high-end brand like Lancome might not do the same thing as, I don't know, a mass brand like NYX Professional Makeup. You know, they're not going to go to market in the same way and talk in the same way. So when there's a trend out there, they could potentially both get on it in a slightly different way or it's going to be relevant for one and not for the other. But that comes back to understanding your brand and understanding what it stands for and where it can operate. You know, it's, it's really about the core understanding of brand DNA and what they do. Well, back to our strategy again, isn't it? Like being, being super clear on the strategies we talked about up front. I'd, I'd love to ask you a couple of more personal questions then in terms of your career. It's, it's, it's lovely to find out about, you know, people's highs and lows and, and, and where they've been on. If you look back over your career, tell me the, the toughest moment you've been in or the biggest challenge you've ever had to face. I think, I think we talked about fact so i think when i when i took up my job in the uk you know it was the end of 2019 and then very quickly we, we moved into covid and there was a certain amount of at least i felt a certain amount of pressure on me to deliver very quickly and so i think you come in and you say okay this is what i want to do and this is how we're going to do it and you sort of just try and tell everybody that's what you want to do and it comes back to this point about cmo being being more chief and and less maybe over operator and so I think I, I quickly figured out that I had to reboot that. And it wasn't about that. It's about getting everybody aligned about what the objective is and letting people do the work. And I think that's probably, you know, that was the hardest point because I think I probably really created a lot of friction and then hopefully turned that around to figure out, okay, you can only do your work through the teams, through the people, you know, an organization of our size, you know, we're almost 90,000 people globally. You can't expect to do something on your own. And so I think that's what comes down to. So being a CMO is, is, is not about doing the artwork or creating the logo, but I'm jealous of when you did that. It's about understanding how the organization works and setting up people for success. And so having that mindset shift and, and putting people in that position suddenly releases you from these sort of situations where 
you're creating friction between you and everybody else in the organization. It's quite a different skill, isn't it? And I, 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 I still find it a challenge. I have to have to be said because I, I enjoy marketing and I enjoy the doing. And it's you know, and everyone's got a point of view. But it, it, there's, there's definitely you can see people that are good at it, can't they? Because the way they inspire people, empower, suggest, encourage, support, all those kind of things, or bring people together, be clear on the problem, all those sorts of things. It, it's definitely definitely a skill set. As you look back, what would you say you're most proud of? in your career so far you know well there's a lot of things i'm proud of i think uh, i think i've had some had some fun in in different places around the world and in different categories but i have to say i think you know being a cmo during covid is probably a time when either you are beaten down or you come out thinking wow we made it or you come out thinking wow i'm proud and it, and it was a supremely difficult time you know what was happening around the world health people's families lockdowns you know there were lockdowns where people were comfortable and they had big houses and big gardens and then there were people who were sat in small small apartments and struggling but i think we did something during lockdown and i couldn't tell you the formula for it where everybody came together everybody was really empowered to make a difference and and we had an amazing year from a business point of view here in the uk you know we grew market share we shifted we'd already started the movement towards e-commerce and really much further down the digital transformation journey and that set us up. You know, I think I always used to tell the teams that it takes a consumer about 60 seconds to, to find their wallet and type their credit card number and to become an online consumer. But for a manufacturer to list a product online, to get the content up there, to figure out what the supply chain flows are, that can take months. So you've got to be ready for something like that. And we were ready. You know, we, we were much more engaged in e-commerce before. And so we really had a year, 2020 in particular, where it was extremely powerful. You know, we, we understood the shift towards performance media without without killing the brand. We were set up online to understand what that meant. So I think that was that was a great year. You know, I think people came out of it feeling good about working extremely hard, but feeling good about it and seeing the success. I remember actually for, for us at System One, we um, our main business is testing advertising, right? And of course, what did everyone do in COVID? Stopped advertising. <laughs> so, well, I mean, we saw our about half our business disappeared overnight, something like that. And um, when you've got a high cost based business like ours, where you've got developers and big databases to maintain and obviously, you know, people to employ, that gets very scary very quickly. And, and you, you, you sort of watch the sales go down every single week and just go, well, where's the bottom, you know, and, and very quickly run out of cash and have to make it be redundant. But you're absolutely right, though, the, the sort of pulling together well i guess it either kills you or it unites you doesn't it i suppose that's that's the thing is it can destroy you or unite you but the the challenge sometimes the these big challenges actually force you to go what is it we're good at yeah. what what could you know and, and pivot as well i mean i know we um we we really focus on advertising as the way out of it because everyone was having to everyone's going can I say this in COVID? Can I show people hugging? You know, it's like all these questions that no one had asked for. So we decided very quickly to provide the answer to that. So to, to try and be helpful and, you know, kind of be part of the solution, you know, rather than suffer the problem. But it, you're right, it's, it's very powerful, isn't it? In, when you've got a collective challenge like that to, to bring people together. And I think it was an incredible time for the, the contract between employees and the organisation and how they felt about work and how work became much more functional and practical when you were sitting at home in front of your computer i had an amazing assistant at the time who became our chief happiness officer you know we did we did team events where people were i think we made cookies at home online on uh, on microsoft teams or made homemade pasta or something similar you know you, you had to do so many different things that, that weren't obvious before and and so keeping people on board focused happy and they worked very very hard during that period Oh, it was very stressful, wasn't it? And, and most people were doing more with less as well. I know. I mean, I mean we, we, I think we had a twenty percent cut. I can't remember exactly what it was now, but you know, we were trying to do, having to do more work for less sales with fewer people. <laughs> it, was, it was very hard, very, very hard. And it was, and it was extremely fast. Yeah, I think you know the, the first, the first sort of wave was everybody moving to e-commerce, and that was the first step. Then the second wave was, well, then everybody figured out you actually needed performance media to drive e-commerce. So you suddenly had to move to that. And I think the third wave was, well, if everybody's bidding really hard on the performance side, you've got to differentiate yourself with activation and events and content. And all that happened, you know, every three, four months, the market was changing. Yeah. And then we got this sort of sudden bounce back, didn't we, as well, that happened the following year. And then after that, this kind of slow slide into, well, it's not, 
it's not technically a recession, but it certainly feels like a recession because of a cost of living crisis, I suppose. It, it has the effect of a recession, doesn't it, in terms of people's disposable incomes going down, which is like a third challenge to deal with. So you kind of went, you know, can't supply, oversupply, uh, you know, cost of living, changes in behaviours. I mean, probably never been a three years like it, has there, yeah. in terms of changing market dynamics? Yeah. True, I think... Uh you know, our, some previous generations talked about living through the war. We've, we've lived through <laughs> yeah, COVID and, <laughs> and we'll remember that. No, but it's true that, you know, consumers are not purely online or purely offline. So the, the, the bricks coming back and rebalancing and people understanding how they want to buy things. And particularly in our business, you know, there's, there's discovery, there's replenishment, there's excitement. You, you sometimes need to go into a store, you know. Fragrance, you know, fragrance, we still haven't figured out scratch and sniff on the screen. So fragrance is still something you want to experience a little bit and do differently. So, so there's so many you know, pieces to balance that. I think what's, what's good for our business, I don't know if, you've saw, if you saw our, our Q1 results, you know, we were probably, I think we we're at plus 13 as a, as a group. You know. It's something called the lipstick effect. I don't know if you've heard of that, which is you know, in times of crisis, people pull back from high value items, so cars and yes, jewelry and yes, holidays, yes, yes, yes. and they go towards yes. beauty and health and wellness because it makes them feel good. So that's great, that's great for our business. And we've, and we've seen that driving us post this uh, this covid period so there's a rebalancing of of on and offline and beauty is still very dynamic and that makes it exciting that's really interesting As, I, I spent most of my career in soft drinks and we had exactly the same dynamic so when um when recessions hit basically people look for everyday treats so you know so like like a pepsi or something you know it, it's not not super premium but we we saw this shift to well it was two things actually one to value for money obviously like a, a squash but also at the top end people were treating themselves so it was the middle bit the loss but basically at both ends it's the the value but also the treat with the, with the things that came through that's it no and we saw you know there was there was a combo of covid everyone was home so wellness exploded so skincare, where people look after themselves, was just colossal. Okay, makeup and fragrance sort of slowed down a little bit, but everybody was looking after themselves. Then you've got this treating effect coming back. So you've seen lots of our categories moving in different ways. Fragrance is on fire as a category. Uh, you just give me such deja vu with that scratch and sniff. Because back in the day, right, every magazine had about five or six kind of little scratch and sniff things or all those mini, mini samples you used to get in sort of GQ and stuff like that. So yeah, what's the equivalent of that now then? So we still do sampling. We have an enormous fragrance portfolio, probably lots of, lots of brands that you didn't even believe are ours because we have licenses for them. So we operate Ralph Lauren fragrances, Armani, Valentino, Prada. And sampling is big in the fragrance world in the, in the most sustainable way possible. But still, you know, it's, you, you need to sniff it and understand a little bit what's going on. You do, on. don't you? Definitely. Now, we were talking about books earlier, weren't we? Uh, Range, David Epstein's book. It's amazing. And I, I know you and I are big fans of that. Uh, there's another book as well that, um, you, you know, is close to your heart, isn't it? Tell me about that book. Yeah, I always talk about those two books. So, so range one of them in terms of in terms of career, and the other one is Quiet by Susan Cain, which is about introverts. I think that says when introverts rule the world, um, and and I think you know those two books for me are always they're almost pillars for me. You know, one explains my career and says, okay, well, all the weird choices I made are actually really useful, and the introverts one is, you know, it, it reminds me that the people who speak first and speak loudest are not always the smartest, or or they don't come across, and they don't have to be the leaders. You know, I. I'm not the, the one who speaks loudest. I'm not good in parties. You know, I, I loved being a restaurant manager and working behind the bar, but I hate being in bars at 11 o'clock at night when there's lots and lots of people and I don't know who to talk to. Um, so that book is, is, is really important and, and, and I love talking about introverts. And so to, to all the introverts listening, what would be your top tips for surviving or thriving? Let's say thriving, let's not surviving. That puts it down, doesn't it? But to thrive in a marketing career at a senior level like yourself, what are the top tips for introverts? Well, so the first top tip's got to be to read that book. Yes. <laughs> because, that, no, because that's the book that explains, you know, it's, it's hard to explain as one top tip what it means to be an introvert and, and to struggle. I think, uh, you know, we were talking earlier about going to dinners. And, and so I go to this dinner uh, kind of almost once a month where there are about 200 people in the room and I feel very intimidated. But then I told myself the reality is when you sit down at the table, there's only one person on either side of you. So suddenly 300 people becomes two. And actually, everybody's interested in other people as a human being. They always want to know what you do about your family. So I think, you know, reminding yourself that everybody else is a human, understanding how you get your energy and, and when you need to speak up or out. You know, lots of time it comes back to public speaking. I've not really got an issue with public speaking as long as I'm prepared. So it's just about preparing. And so planned spontaneity is really important. You know, even when you're going to be spontaneous and talk about something, talk to the team, make a presentation, you've got to prepare and know that. And then I think probably finding recharge times, finding how you relax, how you get your energy back. 
I think one of the things in that book is, you know, you know that you have to spend a bit of alone time or you know you need Netflix or a book to, to recharge. And then I think the last one that, that a coach many years ago helped me with was, was sitting in meetings. And, and they, they gave me this crutch, which was, I know that I need to speak in the first five minutes of a meeting to be comfortable for the whole rest and participate. If I don't crack those first five minutes, then suddenly I'm in the corner trembling and I can't say anything. I don't know if I'm trembling, but... So it, it, it's finding these tricks that help you overcome and then remembering that a lot of that intimidation, we feel two thirds of it's between our ears and in our heads. Definitely. Um, it's one, of the, one of the things we always swear by at System One is always end on a high. And I'm going to ask you about because you just mentioned a chief happiness officer. And, and we know at System One as well, happiness is the most powerful emotion. What does a chief happiness, happiness of, officer do? And how do you achieve happiness? I think that's probably, isn't that the most creative job in any organization? It's about understanding the pulse of how people are feeling figuring out what's going to make a difference, figuring out what what people need, either personally or as an organization. You know, we, we talked a lot about the skills we need in marketing teams, but collaboration is really important, and so people's relationships. So, so I like to spend a lot of time, you know, I've just started a new job in Singapore, trying to spend a lot of time making sure that people get to know each other as humans, not as what's your job, what do I complain about when it hasn't yet done, gotten done. So I think, you know, that, that's the role in the organization of looking after our people, understanding how they are, how they're feeling, how their workload is, but then also what, from a human point of view, is going to make them do their job better and be more comfortable doing it. Is that a secret to happiness? I haven't got that one. <laughs> Was there actually someone's role? I think role? Scott Galloway has a formula. Does he? Oh, <laughs> of course he does. <laughs> but was that, is it actually someone's job called chief happiness officer? Well, it's also my assistant. Yeah. But that's yeah, the most yeah. important part of the job. Amazing. My happiness and everybody else's. Brilliant. Well, that, that's one action from this we're definitely going to take is, uh, yeah, everyone needs a chief happiness officer. Lex, I love it. Thank you very much. That's, that's brilliant. And what a perfect way to end. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for listening, ladies and gentlemen. That was a brilliant episode of the Uncensored CMO. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. If you don't want to miss an episode again, please do hit the subscribe button wherever you get your podcast, whether you're listening or watching on YouTube. If you want to follow me, I'm at Uncensored CMO over at Twitter or find me on LinkedIn at John Evans. Thanks for watching and thanks for listening.